We all love a good story. We especially love a story that ends with the happily ever after. Who doesn't like those? Those are the best stories of all. Our favorite fairy tales or myths or even legends that end in that way are precious to us. Everybody responds well to the happily ever after stories. Our beloved brother J.R.R. R. Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Rings, said the following statement. He was a great lover of legends and myths and tales and stories. And he said, the gospel does not do away with our legends and stories and fables. Instead, it hallows them or blesses them and sets them apart. He says, especially the happily ever after stories. The gospel is the ultimate happily ever after story. It's the real one. All the fairy tales that we tell, they didn't literally happen that way. And yet, even though they're not true historically, they are true in a way because they represent the pattern of the real story of history, which is the happily ever after tale of our great Savior, Jesus Christ, who redeems us and rescues us and gives us that blessing. The gospel, in fact, is the happily ever after story for anyone who wants it. It is offered to everybody, and Jesus gives that blessing to everyone who trusts Him, to everyone who comes to Him, to everyone who calls upon Him, their eternity will be spent happily ever after. So, Ruth chapter 4, which is happily ever after, is, is just an expression of that. This is not a legend. This is not a myth. This is not a fairy tale. This really happened. And it really pictures for us the salvation that we have in Christ. All right. With Ruth 4, we're going to do three things. We will first look at how Boaz plays the man. He does bravely and valiantly at the beginning of the chapter. Secondly, we will look at Ruth's fruitfulness and the blessing upon Ruth in her marriage with Boaz. And then thirdly, we will consider Naomi's happiness and how the Lord has even blessed doubting Naomi with great abundance. And then we'll end with four applications from this chapter and really the book overall. So, and that'll be the end of our series. All right. First, Boaz plays the man last week. You guys remember that Ruth shot her shot with Boaz, went out to the field, approached him, very bold, and how the Lord blessed it with great success, and Boaz rejoiced over the prospect. He wants to marry Ruth. He's obviously a little bit older, single, and he, he's, he's ready. <laughs> he can't believe that Ruth would even think that. He never even entered into his own mind because he didn't think such a thing could happen. So Ruth approaches Boaz, and he tells her, everything's going to be good for you, um, but for me, I got to see about something because, so I'm, I'm, I am a redeemer. That's right. I'm a next of kin that can step in and marry you in the place of your deceased husband. However, there's another guy who's a closer relative and he's got first dibs according to the law of redeemer. So Boaz is going into town and he's going to see what this other guy is talking about. So that's where we are, picking up in chapter 4, verse 1. Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. Distinguished gentlemen and elders of the, of the city of Bethlehem would sit in the gate in the mornings as the people would go in and out, and they would talk of things and discuss business and take care of matters like this. Okay. And what we see in Boaz's conduct here is his integrity and his humility. Boaz is a man of honor. Um, you don't see anything in Boaz that's trying to manipulate the situation. He wants to marry Ruth. He's about it. Uh, the work of a kinsman redeemer 
it wasn't always something that somebody wanted to do. It could be more of a duty that you had to do. But for, for Boaz, it's different. For Boaz, he desires this. He wants this. And you don't see a, any trace in Boaz of trying to you know, pull strings behind the scenes or somehow get this guy to say no. Boaz is a straight shooter. And so he goes right to the guy. He sees him, calls him to turn aside, and tells him what's at stake. All right. So the kinsman redeemer thing again is if a man died before he was able to raise up children with his wife, then a next of kin could step in and marry her and raise up children. And the children would take, they would carry the name of their deceased father. So the father who died, who wasn't able to bless them with children, they would, the, the son would raise up and take that inheritance. In this case, it also includes a parcel of land. It all goes together. It's a package deal. Elimelech, Naomi's ex-husband, they have a place of land, and his sons both died, so there's nobody left to inherit it. So there's only Ruth left. So Boaz is going to step in. He wants to buy the field, marry Ruth, raise up offspring, and then the offspring would inherit that piece of land in the name of Elimelech or Malon, and their line. So the kinsman redeemer thing is really kind of a self-sacrifice thing because you're raising up seeds for another that's going to go on and step into the inheritance of their deceased family. So it really is a work of humility. With that said, though, Boaz is about it. He's all about it. So he goes to the guy, tells him, look, man, there's a field. You know our relative, Naomi. She's back. Elimelech's got the field. You got first dibs. Do you want to redeem the field? And he says, yeah, I'll redeem the field. Okay. And uh, Boaz says, well, before you sign on the dotted line, there's also another aspect to this. If you get the field, you also agree to marry Ruth <laughs> and take her for your wife and raise up seed for Malon and Elimelech's family. And that's when this other guy, this nameless redeemer, says, I can't do that. I... He obviously has family of his own that he's raising up. He has an inheritance of his own that he's raising up. And while he's willing to buy the field for Elimelech, he's not willing to marry the widow for Elimelech. So he says no. Uh, again, you see Boaz's character here. He's not trying to manipulate the situation. When God gives us desires for something good, something that is a possibility within our grasp, we have to be very careful that we don't set our hearts on it so that we start manipulating things. We want to know that God wants us to have whatever blessing this is or thing we desire. We want to know that it's really of God. So we've got to shoot our shot, but we also have to let God work according to the plan and the rules that are in place. Boaz respects and honors the customs that are here and the laws of Moses that God had given to the people. So it's just another feather in Boaz's cap. This is a righteous dude, and he's honorable, and he's humble, and he's lowly. In this chapter, we see Boaz's self-sacrifice. He wants Ruth's good. He wants Ruth to be taken care of. He wants Naomi and the family to be blessed. Um, he wants them to be blessed. Even though he wants to be the guy to do that, he's willing to step down. He's willing to sacrifice his own desires so that everything can be done properly. He knows that if he usurps God's order, there's not going to be blessing on, on, the, on the marriage and the union. and the, There's not going to be that. He knows that. He would rather bow out himself and die to his own desires than allow Ruth to be compromised or left alone. Yo, he's a godly chap right there. And we see that honor as Boaz. He, he, this is a manly thing to do. This is a brave and courageous thing to do. To sacrifice self and trust God. At the same time, he knows he's got a shot and he knows that God will decide it's God who gives these blessings. It's God who writes the stories. And Boaz is so confident in that. He knows if it's God's will that I marry Ruth, 
I can't miss it. Oh, there's some wisdom in that for us, isn't there? As we've seen. So, so Boaz plays the man. He does this. And he's rewarded greatly for it because the dude is not willing to marry Ruth. And that means that the smile started curling on Boaz's old face and he was blessed. He knew that now he would step into something he never thought could happen. God's wonder had barged into his life and given him Ruth as his beloved wife. He couldn't even believe it. There's witnesses there, so you know, when he gathered the guy, again, he's not in some secret corner. He's got elders there, and there's other people gathered around the gate. You know, it probably was boring some mornings in Bethlehem, but everyone could see that this morning in Bethlehem there was a happening that was going on in the gate, so everyone's trying to see what's happening. You know, what's Boaz about now? So there's multitude witnesses. Everyone sees. It's in the open. Boom. Boaz's self-sacrifice is there for all to see. So there's a custom that they had in Israel. You'd, I don't think this was in the law of Moses, but at least in Bethlehem there, when you made this kind of transaction, what's happening is the, the close redeemer, he's waiving his rights, and he's handing those rights, exchanging them over to Boaz. And of course, they had a physical act that would represent that. It's obviously the first thing you and I would think of. He takes off his sandal and he hands it to Boaz. <laughs> and that's the testimony that he is saying no to his right and that Boaz is now number one redeemer and he gets to marry her. All right, so boom, that's what happens. Boaz, just like, just like Ruth, daring, bold, and yet humble at the same time and blessed with great success. It worked. It worked. God will do that to you, beloved, if you set in your mind to walk before God humbly, to submit to His laws and statutes, to do things God's way, God will bless. That's an act of faith that comes from a heart that trusts that God will always do what's best, not just for everyone else, but also for me. He will always do what's best. Okay, secondly, we see Ruth's fruitfulness. So Boaz, this probably didn't take that long. And I can imagine Boaz, he leaves the gate and strolls right over to Naomi's house. Knocks on the door. Naomi opens the door and Ruth is peeking out behind. And they ask him, how did it go? And he says, well, he pulls out from behind his back. And he busts out the dude's slide. He was like, how do you think it went? <laughs> I got it. It's like a trophy now in the household. <laughs> so there's, there's joy. It's the kind of joy, it's, it's like an intoxicating joy. Like the joy of wine that's happening here. It's all coming together now. The long years of waiting and agony and trusting God, they're coming to fruition. It's all happening now. They can hardly believe themselves. They pinch themselves, don't know if they're awake or if it's a dream. And Boaz takes Ruth probably very soon after that, maybe the same day, who knows, takes Ruth as his wife and she conceives and she bears a son. Uh, when Boaz makes the exchange with the nameless redeemer. The elders of Bethlehem and all the people, they offer, they give blessing to Boaz. You know, Boaz is a blesser when he goes out in the field. Blessed, blessed be you of the Lord, he says to his workers. And they say, blessed be you of the Lord. And when this happens, all the people say, um, they say, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who's coming into your house like Rachel and Leah who together built up the house of Israel. Ruth is being compared to the, the, the holy women of old and the wives of the patriarchs. 
there's a blessing upon this marriage and this household. And it's a blessing of the same kind that God gave when He formed the 12 tribes of Israel and the very people themselves. It was a blessing from God. May they be like Rachel and Leah. We might add Rebecca in there. As she went forward, her family blessed her when she went to marry Isaac and said, may your seed triumph over the gates of his enemies. There's this triumphal blessing upon the, the, the son and the sons that would come from these families. And so the people of Bethlehem, they feel this. And they say, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Perez was one of the sons of Judah, who was one of the twelve sons of Jacob and one of the twelve tribes of Israel. His son Perez was the ancestor of people who lived in Bethlehem there. So he was their local ancestor, and Bethlehem was a blessed place for that. Bethlehem was small, little town. We say that the Ephrathites were a clan, but really they were too small to even technically be a clan. This was a little, tiny town in Judah. And their ancestor Perez, who was fruitful and had brought about this whole place and people group of the Ephrathites, and they give the blessing. So the people of Bethlehem, they can see that something amazing is happening. God is working like He worked of old now. Like He worked in the days of the fathers. He's come back and He's working again. We're seeing it with our own living eyes that the kings of old have sprouted forth into life, that the legends are true because we see them happening with our own eyes. God is repeating His work here. It's a great blessing. So, in Ruth's fruitfulness, which we don't know any other children they may have had, but the son, Obed, in this birth, Ruth became a daughter of the women of old. She became a member of the line of those holy women who birthed the patriarchs and the holy men of Israel and ultimately birthed the Christ. She's in that whole line there. And she's one of them. That's how our lives are. We don't realize it. We don't think like that. But what God does in our own lives is the very same thing He's always done in the lives of His people. There's an ancient power at work in our, in our hearts through Christ. There's an ancient power at work when we gather together. It's the same God, the true and living God, who always works in His people in these ways. And miracles and wonders and spiritual glories are happening in our lives. It's the same God. You see this language in the Psalms sometime. There. Asking God to work. Awaken with your right arm. Work as you worked in the days of old. As we read these stories and we learn the things that God did, faith in our hearts will say, God, do it again. Do it now. Do it in my life. Do it in our lives. Do it in this day. Show your glory afresh. God is always doing that. Ruth, this Gentile, Moabite, outcast, widow has nothing by faith has now become a member of this line <laughs> it's pretty amazing she's listed with those blessed women of old we see here that she is forming the lineage of of, of the king the book ends with the short genealogy of david from, from Perez, so under Judah, Perez, and now we're in Bethlehem area, and we go through all these men all the way down to Boaz, who fathered Obed, who fathered Jesse, who fathered David. It's the same genealogy you find in, Genesis, in Matthew chapter 1, in the birth of Christ. It's the same line here. So Ruth's fruitfulness is actually more blessed even than, than Rachel and Leah. It's more blessed. They birthed together the 12 tribes of Israel. 
she is going to be the great-grandmother of the king. The great-grandmother of God's king. That's what we're going to learn about in the life of David. There was prophecies like this. This is Judah we're talking about. I'm going to read a couple of them. First, in Genesis 49, as the patriarch Jacob was facing the grave, he uttered blessings upon his 12 sons. And in Genesis 49, 8 through 12, he blesses Judah with these words. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion. And as a lioness, who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He's washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Well, this is a fair amount of mystery and glorious language in that. But the main kernel there is that the tribe of Judah will provide the ruler, will provide the king. The king, the blessed, promised king of God's people who will lead them forth into victory and blessing and peace. So the people knew this. People in Bethlehem probably knew this. They knew they were the tribe of Judah. They learned it in school when they were growing up. This is the blessing and the prophecy that's given to Judah. The ruler shall come from Judah. Well, Ruth was involved in that line, and David came from her. But it doesn't end with David. David's not the ultimate guy. David, as we'll see, was a hot mess. <laughs> he was righteous as much as God allowed him to be. He did good for the people. He led them forth as a tender shepherd. Yes, he was all that, but he was not the final guy. He also fell into sin. He also brought woe upon his own household through his own sin. He was unfaithful to God at times and broken in his sin. And David ultimately died. He died. When Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, he quotes Psalm 16 to prove the resurrection of Christ. And what he says there is, David in Psalm 16 is not talking about himself. In Psalm 16 it says, you will not allow your servant to see corruption. You will not allow his body to be corrupted or returned to the earth. And Peter says there, David died and was buried, as you know. So this psalm about the true David who will never see corruption, it can't be about our father David because he's dead. His body's in the ground. It must be about his son, the Christ, the one who died and after three days rose again. His body wasn't allowed to see corruption. After three days, he was <laughs> still a little fresh. So he, his body did not undergo decay. He came back and he, was, he fulfilled that promise. So this line through Judah and through Bethlehem, this line of promise, it doesn't end in David, it ends in Christ. This is really about Christ. That's why Matthew quotes word for word that genealogy we just read at the end of Ruth, because Jesus comes to fulfill those promises in that line. After David came and blessed the people, and even his son Solomon united the kingdoms and gave peace to the realm and prosperity, well, they all died, and their sons and grandsons took over, and things did not go well. And in those times, God sent a prophet, Micah, to preach to the people and to give them promises 
about God's blessing that would yet come. People maybe started to think, we had our chance with David, but now God has forsaken us. There's no more blessing for us. Well, we read in a famous passage in Micah chapter 5, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Ruth. Unassuming Ruth. Outcast Ruth. Widow Ruth. Lonely Ruth has nothing Ruth, desperate Ruth, by faith and boldness, trusting in God, inserts herself right into the line of the Messiah. It's one thing to say that, yeah, I'm David's ancestor. That's amazing. But to say, I am the ancestor of the Messiah. (laughs) It's a wonderful blessing that we see. Ruth's faith created immense fruitfulness for her. She was fruitful among the people of God by her faith. Her faith was so great that it took along doubting Naomi with her. And even Naomi was blessed because of the great faith of Ruth. You never know what God is going to do. He's an amazing God. And He loves blessing us with great blessings. Okay, thirdly, consider Naomi's happiness real quick. Look at Naomi. You know, she said, it's over. It's done. That's what she's been saying from the whole book. The Lord has basically forsaken me. He's punished me (laughs) for fleeing the Moab. Now I have nothing left and no one, and it's over. It's done. Well, God had a way of turning that around because now Naomi is blessed. When she came back to Bethlehem, to her homeland. She was embarrassed about everything. All the women in the town were excited to see her and chirping like birds, talking to her. And, and she said, God has forsaken me. She, didn't even, she was embarrassed about everything. But now, look at Naomi. She is blessed in Bethlehem. All the women are praising her and rejoicing with her because Naomi, who was widowed and down and out, she is now holding in her arms Her own dear grandson, Obed. Little Obed was the treasure of Naomi. Was Naomi's heart restored to Naomi, her joy and even her confidence before God. Naomi was blessed with happiness. Uh, The women say to her that may Boaz be blessed who has become to you A restorer of life. A restorer of life. Boaz's kindness to Naomi's family and to Ruth, it rejuvenated Naomi. God does that with His grace to us, beloved. With the joys of the Gospel. And when God comes through for you in your life, just when you need Him to, It rejuvenates you. Your eyes are lit once again. They're like Jonathan when he tasted of the honey and his eyes were brightened. He was lit off that. (laughs) God's grace, it has that effect upon us. It enlivens us and restores life to us. So really, whether you have great faith like Ruth or whether you have small faith like Naomi, God honors faith and blesses it with his good gifts. 
Okay, well, we're going to move to just a few applications as we close this book. Our time has been brief, probably too short, but it is what it is. Four applications from Ruth 4 and from the book. First, from Ruth 4, we find a key to good relationships in the conduct of Boaz. A key to good, healthy, thriving, prosperous relationships is humility and service. Humility and service. That's how Boaz postured his whole self towards this family. Boaz humbled himself to do whatever he could do to bless this family. He offered himself as service. He was willing to take Ruth and marry her. And he was just as willing to step aside and let the other dude who had the first in line do it. It was all the same to him in a way because he sought the good of Ruth and Naomi. If your relationships are rocky and rough, the quickest path that you can take to restoring those relationships and doing everything at least you can do is by humbling yourself and serving. By taking the lowly seat. By considering the other person more important than you. Lifting them higher and serving them. It, this can even be seen on basic levels. If you find that it's difficult for you to make friends, I'll give you a little secret here. One of the most powerful tools for gaining friends for yourself is asking people about themselves and listening to them. If you're the type of person that's talking, talking, talking about you all the time, then maybe you don't have as many strong friendships. Maybe there's not as much loyalty in your relationships because one of those keys is to just take that posture of a servant and interest in the other person. And, 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 and you set the tone by serving them, by doing things to bless them that will communicate blessing to them. You know what I'm saying? That which will speak to them. And if you're thoughtful about that and you lead in that, God will bless it. And if the other person's a Christian, they will definitely respond in time to that. You can be sure of it, that God will bless it to them. You lead when you do that. This is true, especially in marriages. This is a marriage story here. And Boaz blesses this union with humility and with service. We've talked about the blessings of a great marriage from this book. And Ruth and Naomi had this bl blessing came down from heaven. This union together was so joyful. If you're in a marriage that's not so joyful or that is more difficult, this is the key to serve and to humble yourself. You can't control the other person. But what you can do, whether you're the husband or the wife, is set your mind to set the tone and lead by being humble, by owning your faults and sins, not worrying about theirs, by asking for forgiveness, repenting to them, to your beloved spouse, and for seeking to go out of your way to do them good, not to receive anything in return, but to honestly do it unto God to serve them. You'd be amazed what can happen in a marriage when even just one of the people starts setting that tone. If you're married to a Christian, again, you can be confident that in due time, God will bless that. It's a, it's a whole vibe. It's a whole blessing. And as you consider marrying somebody, there's also some keys here. Major key alert from Boaz. You notice how Boaz shows ultimate respect and honor to Ruth's family. If you're considering marrying someone, you know, they're into you. If you're, if you're, if you're in that phase where you're Twitter-pated and you're, you're into each other, well, the person that you're dating or courting there, of course they're going to be nice to you. They're into you. But guess what? That's going to change in the marriage. And if you want to see what they're like more in their natural state, you may notice how they treat others or especially maybe 
how they treat your family. Boaz gave this blessing. It was beyond just Ruth. He wanted to be a blessing to her whole household. That's the whole kinsman redeemer thing. All right, so there's a couple keys for our relationships and marriages. Second application. God's grace is in the business of redeeming and restoring. This is a story of things that went bad. It's a story of loss that God turned around. God loves to redeem. He loves to restore. That's the whole story of the universe is that we ruined it. <laughs> and God is fixing it. It's one thing for God to just give blessing right out the gates, but for something to be destroyed or ruined or broken and then for God to come in and fix it, restore it, give it new life, that's a, that's a totally different ball game. And you have to know, beloved, that God is in the business of restoring. In your life, when you run into things that go wrong, things that break down, things that don't go like you want them to go, and it seems like all hope is lost, you must remember that God loves to restore. He's a redeeming God. <laughs> that should fuel our prayers, should fuel our confidence before Him, should fuel our patience as we work through difficult situations to know that God can, if He but wills it, step in and change everything in this situation. God's grace restores. That's the name of the game in the gospel, is restoration. Third application, God rewards faith. God honors faith. He loves faith. Faith is that which pleases God. And faith is something that's expressed in our prayers, our desires, and in our actions before God. And wherever we rely on God, God honors it. It's good in your life to be put in desperate situations. The Christian life is like that on purpose because those times when you're truly desperate, you have nothing and nowhere to turn, you turn <laughs> To God in desperation, like Ruth. And when you do that, God comes through. He honors our faith. Let us be careful to cherish the faith He's given us, to nourish it, to ask His blessing that our faith might grow. What is our faith? It's our trust in Christ right now for everything, for our eternal salvation and for our daily bread and for everything we need in this life and for all eternity. It's trusting not just for my life, but for those I love. I'm entrusting my loved ones to God, everything to God. We always have to direct to Him. It says somewhere in the Chronicles that the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the earth, searching for those whose hearts are completely His, that He may be strong on their behalf. God's eyes are peeled for that heart that is clinging to Him and wagering everything on God and His promises. Everything. He rewards faith. And when we struggle with doubt, He's merciful with it. He's tender with us. A smoldering wick He will not put out, it says. When our faith is just but flickering, about to be extinguished, God nourishes that faith. Ask God to bless your faith, to grow your faith, to increase your faith. Ask Him to help your unbelief. He loves those prayers. I try to mention that often. God rewards faith. And then fourthly, we see in Boaz a shining type of Christ, a brilliant display of the glory of Christ. Boaz's whole joint here was self-denial. The story would have been good enough if Ruth had approached Boaz and Boaz says, Bet, I am one of your redeemers and I'm the first up and I'll, I'll marry you. That would have been a great story. Chapter 4 here, though, adds a whole other dimension of, of Boaz's self-denial. He sacrificed himself in order for Ruth's good. And as he sacrificed himself, he showed 
that he really did love her. Not for his own selfish desires, but for her sake. Because he wanted to do right by her before God, even if that meant he misses out. And that heart posture of Boaz, that's just a, a taste of the glory of Christ who displays his love for us in his self-sacrifice. That is where we know the love of Christ. That is where he expresses his love for you on the cross. The cross where Jesus, in pursuing you to save you, had to deny himself. He had to lay aside his own desires as a man, as a human. He had to deny himself and sacrifice himself and gave himself up. You know, Boaz, he was willing to step out of that union and, and go on living his merry and prosperous life in Bethlehem. Some level of self-sacrifice. For Christ, he gave up his own life. He was nailed to the tree for us. And that's where he shows that amazing love. That's where he fulfills the kinsman redeemer who's one of us, who's partaken of our nature, who's compassionate with our weakness, who's sensible to our sufferings, who's like us in all things except sin, and who took the wrath and punishment that we deserve so that we might be saved. It's a brilliant expression of the glorious gospel in Boaz. You have to see Christ that way, beloved. He gave up everything to save you. He gave up His own self. He offered His infinitely beautiful, glorious, sinless, perfect self for you. And He did it willingly, gladly, lovingly. If He did that for you, how much more will He freely give you all things? Why would He ever turn you away? Why would Christ ever give you a cold shoulder? Why would He ever ignore you or forsake you or leave you if He did that for you? He never will. So we have to remember and go back to the cross all the time. That's where we get the name of this church. God's redeeming cross where Jesus buys us back, purchases us, takes us for His own, claims us, shelters us, protects us, saves us, makes us His own forever and ever and ever. It is a marvelous display of the glory of Christ. Okay, so in this final chapter of Ruth, we've seen Boaz's bravery in sacrificing himself. He's valiant. We've seen Ruth's fruitfulness. Her faith brought great blessing to her life. And we've seen that even doubting Naomi was blessed by it. We've seen these applications, the key to a good relationship, and especially marriage, humility, and service. That's what the name Obed means, servant. God's grace restores and redeems. God rewards our faith. And Jesus expresses His love for us in His self-sacrifice on the cross. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we ask Your blessing on this book. I pray that we would remember our short time in Ruth and that when we're reading through our Bibles and we read it again, we pray that You'd show us even more. There's way more here than we were able to cover. So, season our hearts with this grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.